So, as you, as I said, my name is Jeff Mulcahy. I'm the emergency manager here in Sandy City. I've been here about four years. Retired from the Air Force uh, four years ago to take this job. So it was a it was a great great move, great move uh, switch for me. Um, one of those things, you, you know, everybody goes to school and gets a degree, and how often do you get the degree and what you're actually doing for a living? You know, unfortunately for me, my degree is emergency and disaster management. So I saw this opportunity and jump. And after 32 years, thought I'd give somebody else a chance to go fly missions in the Air Force. So, um, you know, your, your previous speaker, she uh, she talked a little bit about Paradise, uh, California. I'm from Redding, California. Some people call it Southern Oregon, so far north. But the Paradise is, is right down the road. And uh, you know, she and she talked about zombies. You know, she didn't see any zombie apocalypse stuff going on right there. And First thing I think, oh, my lead slide, I'm talking about zombie apocalypse, great. Um, my wife and I were talking, actually talking about zombie apocalypse. She says, you're an emergency manager, what do you, you know? Everybody talks about, you know, the whole catastrophe, zombies and things like that. What's your thoughts on that? And I really didn't have anything. She says, well, let me share what I think it is. And, uh, and I never thought about this before. She says, what about uh, people and drugs? How many people do you know that take drugs every day just to just to maintain, uh, you know, whether it's uh, a good attitude, you know, not be depressed all the time, you know, all kinds. There's all kinds of drugs out there that are every day. So when when those are gone, when people don't have those. She says those are going to be our zombies that are going to be walking around. We're going to have to deal with those kinds of people. But uh, what I'd like to start with is uh, leadership and management. See if I can make this thing work right. Um, that, that's kind of where, where everything starts. Uh, in, in doesn't matter what business we're in, whether we're government, whether we're, we're non-governmental, or, or uh, even uh, uh, not-for-profit organizations. But exhibiting leadership tax is, is one way to find out what gaps you might have in your emergency operations plans. Um, and closing them with key training it, uh, will help all who are affected, whether it's citizens, responders, um, again, those that are employees that, that, that are out there uh, working for us. And uh, what can we do to close the gaps that we have? Well, we need to develop uh, key leadership qualities that will help our programs become more resourceful. We need to implement positive training opportunities that will help our employees, our stakeholders, and our residents, once again, uh, be better prepared. And we need to learn from those who have been affected by previous incidents. So we need to reach out to people that have experience, people that can share what they what they've learned, provide solutions, and what their best practices might be, and then we might be able to share our own best practices with them. So, while well, I you know I just mentioned I was serving in the Air Force, I heard about heard a lot about leadership and management, and I was always told you manage programs, but you lead people. There are many similarities between the two concepts, but understanding their differences are uh, particularly important. Forbes magazine, they published an article listing some of the key differences, which were pretty simple. Management deals with policies, programs, duties, as I mentioned. And leadership, however, it's all about motivating individuals. Who loves to motivate individuals? Not me. <laughs> uh, in, in my business, I, I deal a lot with businesses. I, uh, residents, uh, volunteers that come out, and uh, <coughs> sometimes trying, trying. Well, how, how many of you like preparing something for something that you hope never happens? You know? uh, emergency management is kind of kind of that way. Uh, people don't like to spend money on it. Uh, people don't like. Man, it, it's just like you know what? I got day to day stuff I got to deal with. I don't want to deal with all this, all that stuff on top of it. Um, but. What we find is there are in some individuals that are good leaders and they're good managers, but not that doesn't necessarily mean that you can that everybody is a good leader and a good manager. You know, some manage real well, some some uh, are able to uh, to lead real well. When I was flying on the airplane back in the Air Force days, I, I was a, as an airborne linguist, and there were two facets to that position. You had people that are linguists. So you knew a language really well, or you were a good operator, and you knew how to take that information and get it off the plane, you know, identify bad guys, stuff like that, to drop bombs on them, which was always a good thing. Um, I, 
was not a good linguist. I knew enough to get me by, but managing those that work for me, those people, and trying to get them to be good linguists, it was hard for me to make them better linguists because I wasn't a very good linguist. But I was a good operator, and I could I could run the system, and I could put off reports and do everything that I could. So I was able to manage that process, those processes really well. And it's kind of like that with with, uh, with emergency management. Um, you know, you're out there working with the people, or you're out there working the processes. Um, a good leader, he'll understand the difference between uh, managing and leading, and being able to identify those that, that are able to, to do both and put them in good positions. But let's talk about the management side here for, for just a second. Many organizations, they, like I said, they invest a lot of, or very little time, effort, or resources to prepare for uh, the management of an inevitable outcome of the catastrophe. Um, that discipline is, is the core of emergency management, but not business continuity. How many like cars? I like cars. I've never been a car guy. I, I could run my, my position on the airplane, love the airplane, but I don't understand cars. But I know a lot of people, they love, they love greatest, the latest, greatest thing in, in cars. So I want to kind of equate this to two vehicles. Uh, these are some of, some of the greatest, or latest tech, uh, cars with a lot of technology and things that they make them go fast. They make them very, I guess, kind of like your cell phone, if you will. I mean, when you plug it in, you can use all that technology. Um, but these are, these are state-of-the-art cars that have all the bells and whistles on them. But what if you, you, that car, you don't understand it totally, and, and they forget to put in the jack and the manual on how to use it, change the tire, and things like that. Uh, that's, that's kind of like if the wheels fall off your emergency operations plan. You know, that car's not going to be very good to you. Well, your emergency operations plan isn't going to be very good either. Um, it will likely result in disorganization. People will be disconnected from one another. Uh, there's going to be a lot of chaos and confusion. I've experienced these things in emergency operations centers. Um, and also, uh, you face some hard facts about uh, where, your, where your corporate teams are in, in, in regard to handling an emergency. But we have expe expectations. Um, how many of you have ever read your emergency operations plan in your counties? Or are they about that thick and it's like, oh my goodness, well, you know, that's nighttime reading because that's going to put me to sleep. Mine's about that thick and I'm thinking, when we have something going on, oh my goodness, nobody's going to read that. Nobody's going to try to figure that out. But uh, there is good information in there if you can weed through and find out what it is. It's good to know, especially from, from your guys' perspective. Um, most of you facilities managers, security guys, right? Um, being able to know how to you're, you're probably, are any of you a part of an emergency management team or work at an emergency operations center in your counties? Yeah, so you got one, one or two back there. So you can see how if, if you don't know or understand the plan and you go rolling in to a, a disaster, uh, what do I do now? Am I going to read that big thing? No, that's not happening. Um, but then when you think about what, what are the employees and your responders, what do they expect of you? What, what are your stakeholders? What do they expect from you? You know, especially, we all have residents that, that look to us for different things, right? What do they expect? And you, you gotta be able to know and understand what's going on in that plan so that you're able to, to provide for them. So I, I, I'm gonna go through a lot of gaps. This is kind of disordered. I've never presented on this topic before, so I'm, I'm still struggling with it. But, but what I'd like to do is identify four realities right here. Um, so most governments or businesses, they don't full, em, fully employ a full-time emergency manager because they believe uh, managing a disaster can, can be handled by any of the public safety organizations uh, or functional management staff. Uh, how many, anybody here dual had and, and serve as emergency manager? No, you're lucky. I know a lot of, so a lot of the people that I deal with and work with, they're either firemen their police officers, their facilities managers, their security managers, you know, they, uh, they run the whole gamut. Um, I, I believe that I am, I am about the only 
true emergency manager full time in the valley, except for our county emergency managers. They are they are full time emergency managers. Um, as I said, most most of them wear two hats. They're uh, and so unfortunately, uh, emergency management is the one that kind of goes on the wayside. And there's a lot of places that aren't aren't prepared. There's also a heavy emphasis of organizational leaders on, on data, IT equipment. You know, we looked at the cars earlier. I mean, they'll spend a lot of money on, on uh, bringing the, or, or uh, protecting that data and recovery systems and whatnot. And they don't take into account the, uh, the need for employee preparedness or the capabilities essential to the response and recovery of the whole organization. And, the assumption that managing emergencies is a, is a natural consequence of managing uh, the organization. It's led to a deficiency of proper planning, training, and exercises uh, that help us manage life safety and uh, response operations. When was the last time you guys participated in an exercise or were at some emergency management type of training? Ever? Yes, sir. Uh, we were County just did a, a huge um, exercise with FEMA where we um, activated our DOC. We did a huge, uh, it was um, right before the great shakeout the week before. Okay. And this was this was big. FEMA came in from, and it was a week, week long exercise. And you know, they did the earthquake drill, they would hit this time. And, and we had a sim cell and we did a simulation where we were calling in and doing the whole nine yards activating and everything. It was it was a pretty intense day. Did you hate it? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I was watching the clock the whole time, going, "Come on, let's get this over with." They yeah. put you in situations that made you a little uncomfortable. Didn't it was it? very stressful. Yeah, it really was. Even though I knew the whole time that it was just a drill, it was just there was a lot going on. Phones ringing, things just happening, you know, in that operations center. Did you learn anything? Oh yeah. Yeah, did I think we're not as prepared as I thought. That's for sure. Well, amen. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's funny, but we have that, we have the same opportunity. It's, it's uh, called the Integrated Emergency Management Course. Uh, FEMA's going to come here to Sandy next year, and we're going to do the same thing that we were kind of get. Good luck, Alan. Oh, I, I know my uh, my boss is already like, well, are we? You sure we want to do this? I'm yeah. Like, but uh, no, it's always a good learning experience. It was. Good. Funny part about the FEMA training, though, is I don't know if anybody else participated in exercises within your jurisdictions. No. Wow. On the side note, FEMA was impressed. That's good. Yeah, they were. They, they, they were. They couldn't believe how close knit the whole community was. Yeah. Did they uh, Did they throw enough stuff at you that you knew that you were never you were going to die? It didn't matter what you. I've been exercising with those guys from a simple active shooter thing that led to poisonous gas that led to uh, evacuation that led to you know finally when we gone there's a whole day process the very end it was like okay now there's a plane with terrorists out that's going to come and they're going to crash into your city it's like come on man help us out of here let us win they didn't want to do that um, let's see let's see we talked a little bit about training experience and insight needed to effectively harness the uh, coordination of response and recovery in a major emergency it's it's best left. You know, those things are best left to those who are qualified. Or usually, you know, emergency managers they, they have the time to, to sit and do that planning and and, and uh, cover those gaps. Now, I'm not saying that every every emergency manager is, is going to be the best. Um, like I said, most most are dual hatted, and, and it's a hard it's hard for them to be able to to uh, to cover all the gaps. But they can they can get things going and get things ready. Um, one of the biggest gaps that we find are uh, that are most commonly absent in emergency operations plans are uh, having a, a family preparedness program or a preparedness for, for employees. Now, I was telling you a little bit about my Air Force experience. Once again, uh, one of the responsibilities I had was overseeing uh, mission management for our squadron, and we would deploy it all around the world. And uh, for some reason, when you deploy in the military, that seems like it's always the best time for the spouse to empty out your bank account, want a divorce, custody battle with the kid, you know, something something terrible, something terrible there. Um, 
the well, we flew command and control missions, like I was saying, and uh, I would find, you know, here's a member of my crew that's really uh, psychologically unfit to fly. Their, their mind's on the ground. They're worried about back home and what's going on uh, with their kids and with their spouse and with their bank account and things like that. And uh, it, I wouldn't be able to let them fly. I have to take them off, off the crew so they don't jeopardize, jeopardize the safety of everyone that's, that's flying. And then the same holds true with our employees that work in our organizations. Um, one of the biggest fears I have is, you know, we have this big earthquake that everybody talks and says, we're gonna have this thing. And uh, are my first responders, my police and my fire guys, are they gonna go lights and sign and head home and just, and just leave the community? Would they do that? They assure me that they're not, but oh, no, we're, we're professionals. And uh, we've even, set in place a procedure. Our Parks and Recs Department, they're, they've been tasked, they've accepted the assignment, that they would reach out to all the families of our first responders. They would make sure that they're safe in a, in a secure location, that they have what they need. Um, they would report that information back to us in the emergency operations center, and then we would make contact with the first, responder, first responders that are on the street and assure them that their families are being taken care of so they can still be on the street and do what they need to do. But it's you know it still remains to be seen what's really going to happen. Um, you know when we when we talk about it, I know a lot of people. I'm going home. I'm going to go take care of my family. I'm going to stick around here. You know, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, one of the things that we also do is, is encourage those employees to to make uh, make their own family plans to to get stuff in order so that their families, they know that their families can be taken care of. They, they have water and food stored. They, they have the ability to be self-reliant while they're, while they're the employees at work. Um, other, other things to consider are if they're home when a disaster occurs, will they come back to work? Um, I've heard stories of employees that they just flock back to work during a disaster situation. I've heard situations where nobody showed up so you you really just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we write it into our emergency operator, into our employee handbook that everybody that, that works for the city is a, a disaster response worker uh, in the event of a disaster, and that they're required to come to work. But you know that remains, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, add with added that the corporate fear, we'll call it. Um, they manage, they may feel intimidated by, uh, or threatened by the lack of understanding of emergency management's best practices. They, they may think, well, what, what's an incident command system? What, what is that? What, how do you operate and maintain an emergency operations center? You know, you, you combine all these things and you kind of get a perfect storm for a, for a, for a failed response to a major, a major disaster. Have you ever been in a disaster before? You work in, San, in, in, the, in Utah, right? You're living in Utah, we don't have them. The downside is we don't have them. We don't, we don't prepare for them. We don't know them. how would we respond. How would our, 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 our uh, I have trees down in power out of my building right now, so <laughs> that's a disaster for me. There you go. You know, and that that brings up a good point. You know, how big does something have to be to be a disaster? You know, I, I look at. Our city, for example, when police and fire, they go out and they take care of residents, you know, they were calling, and they, somebody fell down, or there was a car accident, or a house on fire. They don't call me. I'm not even involved in those processes. Uh, water main break, or something like that. Public utilities doesn't call me. It's not a big deal. To the city, because those guys are already taking care of it. You know, uh, of course, there are bigger things that happen. We may have to rely on mutual aid from other, other municipalities to come in and help us. Um, but when you look at a family, for example, if I'm on my way home from work this afternoon and I'm in a, I die in a car accident or something like that, you know, for my family, they, you know, police and fire, they're going to show up, they're going to take care of their business, not a problem. But for my family, that's going to be a big disaster. And as was mentioned, you know, for his building right now, he's got a disaster going on. He's got to get out and fix that stuff or somebody's, somebody's got to take care of it. continuity planning versus emergency management. So this is another gap in 
you need to assess where you are in regard to the continuity operations planning, which is a big part of the emergency, man or emergency management process. Some people think that uh, those, are, those are separate things, but really they work together. Um, they must, they've got to be anchored together for true collaboration so that you understand what's needed, what's important, and what is effective as far as the process is. Uh, let me give you an example. I take company, I'm going to call it 321 Emergency Inc. Uh, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on those IT processes, those recovery processes, and all those things. Seems like everything is IT related now, at least here in our city. That's, everything's gone that direction. All the money's gone that way. Um, so they, they established very detailed uh, recovery plans and strategies, but intentionally they exclude all the other departments because they want to share that money. Um, they have that, we're in charge, and we know what's best attitude. And, and, and it's not, so they put these things in place. And, and say, for example, not, not long after that, they have a fire uh, at their main data facility. And in fact, despite the planning that they've done, they, uh, they didn't create a simple evacuation plan uh, or conduct any drills for the employees. So when the fire happened, people didn't know where to go. They, they weren't, you know, we think about when we're back in elementary school. I mean, how often did you do a fire drill? All the time, right? And you had that muscle memory. I know I gotta line up, I gotta follow the kid in front of me, and we're gonna go out over here and do this thing. Um, actually, that works with adults too. As silly as it seems, if it, uh, people know and understand where they need to go, where, where, they, uh, where they gather. We, we just did one as part of our shakeout exercise, evacuated our building and were able to take accountability in just a short time. We had 100% accountability of all our employees in the city. Uh, a lot of people, this is silly, why do I have to do this? But we were able to get it done and, and nobody, I didn't have to send fire guys in to look for somebody because that uh, refuse to leave the building because they want to keep working. Because that would be the process. Well, this example actually did happen for one company. And uh, because of it, uh, nobody was killed or injured or anything like that. You know, they did have a fire, but they were able to uh, get everybody out. Um, but it did identify a lot of weaknesses that they had in their, in their plan and led to a lot of changes within the company. So, closing some of the gaps. Um, one thing you need to do, you guys are facilities managers here, um, so you're kind of on this list too. So don't allow IT or risk or compliance or security or facilities or police and fire, any of those guys. Um, don't let them plan in a silo. You want to be part of the team. and. Uh, Everybody's got their own specialty that they bring to the table, but they all lack a broader understanding of emergency planning. This isn't a criticism, it's just a reality. Um, you, you can't necessarily expect your stakeholders to play nice and collaborate with one another. It just won't happen. To ensure some accountability, consider some of these other options. Establish a planning team. You know, representatives, all the, bring all the key players together. Um, we recently had a water event. Some of you may have heard about here in Sandy, a little water quality issue. Um, by the time I went, the, the event occurred a week before they even brought me in. I didn't even know that it was going on. And when they did, I found out that uh, the State Department, the EQ, the Health Department, County Health Department, and Sandy City, for the whole week that they're going back and forth on what's going on with water, they weren't even in the same room. They were all on the phone, conference calls, looking at hopefully the same maps and the same uh, reports that were, were coming out. Um, when we did end up opening our emergency operations center, you know, it's like, I'm not opening up unless everybody's at the table. We're all going to sit and we're all going to talk. So everybody sent a representative. They didn't have a problem with that. I just didn't understand why they hadn't done that before. But it made that process work much more smooth than, uh, than it had been. So, yeah, avoid the turf wars um, and make sure that everybody's at the table and they're heard. And if you don't already have them, I'm sure as counties, all the counties are pretty sure that have already uh, signed an emergency manager. 
Uh, they may not be full time. I know most of them are either sheriffs or, or uh, part of the fire departments in some of the smaller rural, rural counties. Um, but uh, they, those guys, they have the, they they go to the trainings and they gain that experience and they're able to uh, provide the, the, the input to that group of what needs to happen and how the plans can be successful and put together some a guiding document. That has the organization's philosophies, culture, and methodology for handling emergencies. Um, you don't want to leave planning a chance. Sometimes I show a video. I wasn't able to get it into this one here, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, a uh, FEMA video, and it's a, a family. And the father comes in, he sits down, and he's like, "All right, we need to talk about family planning here for for disaster." And uh, each thing he brings up on his little checklist is something. For example, who's going to forget to pack the batteries? Who's going to, who's going to, you know, use their uh, get out the, the cell phones that probably won't work? And who's going to be in charge of making lists that we won't use or checklists that we won't follow? You know, and each of the the kids say, oh, "I'll do that, Dad. I'll do it." You know, and he's like, "I can never be more proud." You know, it's like, don't leave, don't leave it to chance. Um, it video's a lot better than my description, I assure you. <laughs> but. Uh, but it's a, it brings up a good point. That you, you, you want to make sure that your checklists are working. You want to make sure that you're following them, uh, that you're you're exercising them, so that you know what what works, what doesn't work. Let's throw this out. Let's let's add this in. Um, it's it's important to the planning process. Now some lessons that I learned. Uh, you know, I'm talking about we we opened up our emergency operations center and again. Emergency managers aren't perfect. Unless you actually do something, you're not going to know what, what what's going to happen or, or how it's, the process is going to work. And this was the first time the San Diego has ever stood up their emergency operations center. So I really didn't know what to expect. And actually, it was kind of a perfect storm. You know, it, the event occurred after that big snowstorm we had in February. Then uh, there was some remodeling done where my emergency operations center is. Uh, they took away a third of it, so my whole configuration was, I didn't have one at that point. Because they did the remodeling, everything that I had from my emergency operations center was in a trailer down in a parking lot. So they said, open up the emergency It's like, on a holiday weekend, are you kidding me? This is awesome. So we, uh, but we did identify a lot of issues besides those things. I know, I, I know those can be controlled and cleared, but for example, our policy group, which is made up of all of our, uh, our mayor and his administration, our, uh, our directors, they need to be activated. They, they didn't even get together. But we really didn't, you know, number two, we didn't have any clear objectives on what to do. You know, I, I opened the emergency operations and we said, get water, get, a, get uh, volunteers to go and assist with, uh, with water sampling. So we did that. But a lot of times, People didn't understand, well, boy, who's in charge? Is, where's the manager? Is he running this place? Is the mayor running? Because everybody was in there together and talking. And I kind of lost control of all that. Our joint information was in the same room, you know, our joint information center. And so a lot of the information was, they'd hear something, ah, oh, they're working on that. We should, we should tweet that out or whatever, you know, social media stuff. So we had some issues there. You know, when I called, I'm like, because we've never, opened up before, I called up some of my guys and they're like, really? We're going to stand up? It's, it's a holiday weekend, what are you talking about? It's like, no, we're standing up in the emergency operation. No, you're just kidding, right? I had to have that same conversation with everybody that I called. You know, that, so that was kind of an issue. And then a lot of people, we couldn't even get a hold of them because we didn't maintain your current uh, contact information in the different departments of people at their home uh, to contact them when they're at home. Other issues that, you know, I mentioned setting up uh, our problems that we had there. Uh, when the new administration in Sandy came on, they, they let go of our emergency coordinator, we had somebody specifically in that position. We called that 150 volunteers and didn't have anybody to, to corral them, wrangle them, do whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. I had to ask the uh, American Red Cross to come in and do our volunteer management for us. Uh, one of the things we found out was people staying in their own lanes. You know, I mentioned that a little bit. We had a, too many people in the, in the area, and everybody would step outside the boundaries of, of their their responsibilities. And, oh, I, I can tell you that. I, why don't you do this? And so that got to be a little confusing. Um, and then 
I failed to establish a battle rhythm early on, and so I had some issues myself. But these are just about some, some of the gaps that, that, that uh, we identified. <clears throat> Let's see. We mentioned exercises earlier. Now, these are good examples of those key trainings uh, that we mentioned before when we're talking about the leadership tactics. Uh, in the city here, we exercise four times a year, mainly with tabletop exercise and functional exercises, and we do a full-scale exercise, actually roll trucks and things like that, twice, uh, once every other year. Following the exercise, I'm able to do, in the Air Force we call it a hot wash, but everybody sits around and says, oh yeah, these are the good things, these are the bad things. Um, and do a lot of documentation there, as well as provide feedback forms, so those feedback forms they're asking to fill out, do those because they actually they actually work, and then I'm able to take that feedback and put together an after action report and improve my plan. And so here's what happened. Here's how we're going to get better, and share that with my leadership and and uh, implement those those improvements. We also apply accountability there. So if something did go wrong, we, uh, we identify what department that process would fall under and then assign somebody to, to handle that, to, to get on. And so we give, we give them a deadline and have them report back. Um, in total, you know, I showed you that, that list. Those are just a few. We had actually 30 improvement items that we found that we need to work on. And, and then we're in the process of fixing those. Uh, most of them are easy fixes. So we should, we should be able to fix those gaps rather quickly. Now, we talked about the people a little bit before. It was interesting, the previous speaker, she talked about the people as well. And, and they're probably our, our greatest asset. Um, our, our, every organization's goal is pretty much to be resilient. And from a company standpoint, um, they want to support their stockholders, their investors, their customers, and continue to lead. Uh, the long-term financial viability of the community that serves. But one thing that's often forgotten in people's plans is, is the people or the employees. Uh, every, every business continuity plan or emergency operations plan should include or begin and end with an understanding of them that regardless of your, your organizational controls and sophistication and technology, all that stuff, none of it can run itself. It's gotta be, it's gotta be left up to the people. The employees are the ones that, that make that happen. Each of, those, each of those plans, they need to beg that question. What have, what have we done today to ensure our employees are equipped and capable of supporting recovery? Because that's, you know, we're gonna suffer a disaster, but we're gonna have to recover afterwards and as quickly as possible. And we need to be able to support our employees. We need to get them back to work. We need to provide them with tools and training that will help in those recovery processes. I do that on time. Well, I don't know if I'm over or under. You're, you're okay. You're starting <laughs> a little late. Um, so as, as I talked about earlier, um, you need to have a robust employee and family preparedness program because if that employee is affected in the emergency, if his family is affected, they're not going to be as inclined to come to work and, and participate in that recovery process. Um, we're able to provide a lot of training uh, to, to curb that. One of the things that I, that I try and keep my uh, folks here in the city engaged in we do. Uh, we have a neighborhood rapid assessment program. We have new software that we're using. It's called City Serve Application. It's, that uh, you can anybody in the city can see a pothole or a light post down. Maybe a, a, a fire plug has been broken off, or a water leak, or something like that. They're able to just take that application, take a picture of it, and uh, it will geolocate where that uh, where that uh, problem is. And it will automatically feed this system in, into the in our public works or our public utilities or whatever department. It asks them, you know, what, what problem is this, and it'll assign itself. So they'll actually get the uh, the information uh, in real time, and they'll be able to send a crew out, get it fixed. Once the crew has it, you know, and the resident or whoever reports it will get a message back on their phone that says, hey, you know, you're you're uh, we've received your uh, your. Uh, in your invoice, your work order. Uh, here's who it's been assigned to, uh, and you'll be contacted 
further when we when we uh, fix it. And once our guys, our crews go out and fix it, they'll take a picture of it, it'll automatically load it, and, and the resident will get a picture back and says, hey, the work's been done. We apply this to, that's part of our emergency management plan, that in a disaster, if people do neighborhood rapid assessments, as you walk down the street, you get, oh, that house is bad, that house is bad, that, you know, and these are gonna feed right into our emergency operations center. We'll be able to establish priorities and be able to go out and fix those things as they come up. Uh, this is something that's used, we found on the East Coast a lot during hurricanes and whatnot. So, so we, we train our employees on that and as residents as well. We, uh, we have training each month for our citizens. They come out to, uh, we try and help businesses become more resilient and, uh, and uh, maintain their, their business continuity plans. So other, there's a lot of other trainings op opportunities. I won't go through each of these. I'll make these available to uh, to the folks here, and but I mean, there's you can do stuff online. You can do stuff. You can go back to FEMA courses. You can do FEMA courses up here at the state office building for emergency management. A lot, a lot of different opportunities are, are there. And uh, finally, there's some additional gaps that you might might be thinking about. Um, who do you do business with? Who delivers your stuff? Do you have memorandums of understanding? Uh, do you have relationships with organizations outside your area that could help you in a disaster? And do you understand what volunteer organizations active in a disaster are? So, you know, places you do business with, you're gonna you're gonna want to talk to them. You may you can be as prepared, cover all the gaps, have everything ready to go. But if you rely on other organizations to, to help you, to supply you, whatever it might be, you're gonna sit there with Nothing and not be able to do anything because you're, you know, you're, you can't get stuff, you can't uh, do anything, you know, deliveries, things like that. If you're not getting your supplies, um, if you need pipe or fire hose or whatever it might be, and you're not getting it, and your crews are there and ready to go, but they have nothing to do because they, they're waiting on resources. So it's good to have those discussions with, with those who, who provide uh, stuff for, to you, those resources and places you do your business with. Having memorandum of understanding with those organizations is huge because there's like an obligation there. You talk about it, you're, you're going to work together and get these things done. Um, I mentioned relationships outside the area. It's like, well, why would I do that? Um, when you think about Salt Lake Valley here, for example, if this big disaster occurs, this big earthquake, everybody in the valley is going to be buying for the same resources. You know, they're going to want the same contractors. They're going to, they're, everybody's going to be wanting the same whatever it might be. Uh, piping, hose, all that stuff, you know, it's going to be, it's going to go at a premium. Um, we, so Sandy City, we have, we have uh, MOUs in place with Brigham City and also with the company out in Texas called Garner uh, in, uh, Emergency Services, that they will come out and they'll help us as a city bring resources with them to help us rebuild and get back on our feet and help that, that respond or that uh, recovery piece. And uh, are any of you familiar with volunteer organizations active in disaster? We're talking Red Cross, Salvation Army, uh, you know, the LDS Church, uh, Church of Scientology. I, I got into this business. I had no idea that all these these places had disaster uh, response organizations, um, and they bring a lot to the table. They can they can house and feed and do all those things necessary to help you recover and get back on your feet. Um, and they're they're a great great resource for us. But uh, let's see. We don't care what an emergency manager does, right? I don't, I don't know if this is appropriate for you guys or not, but uh, talking about acts of God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th there's a lot of gaps out there, and unless you dig into it, you're not going to be able to identify them. So if you have the opportunity or, or the, the moxie, if you will, and you take on that, that emergency operations plan, participate in exercises and things, that's where you identify you know, those, those shorts shortfall those gaps. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Does anybody have any questions for me? Alright. And I will uh, I'm going to turn the mic off and turn it over to the, I guess, yeah. the next speaker. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.